So it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Alexander Belling from Department of Theoretical Physics, CERN, uh, in our QSTM uh, Zoominar. This is the 71st QSTM Zoominar. And he's going to speak on about the OP randomness hypothesis and Euclidean wormholes. And thank you for uh, agreeing this, agreeing to give this talk in our forum, Alexander. And we are welcoming you in the forum. So you can start. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Santa, and thanks for the invitation to, to be giving this, this seminar today. Um, so I'll be talking about some recent work that came out over the last year. The talk's mostly going to be based on, on two papers. Um, one paper that came out last June with Jan de Boer at the University of Amsterdam, and also some more recent work from a few months ago uh, with Jan and also Julian Sonner and Pranjal Nayak from the University of Geneva. And uh, as Anthony already mentioned, you can see on, on my first slide, uh, it's written in red, please ask questions. So I really plan to, to make this a very informal talk. Um, so really please do, do stop me uh, and do ask, uh, do ask questions. Uh, maybe another comment is that this is, I guess, supposed to last uh, roughly two hours plus times for questions. Um, I, I'm basically going to be giving the same amount of material that I would give in a, in a one hour seminar, but I'm just going to really try to take my time and, and go through everything um, slowly. So if you ask questions, it'll also uh, help to, to, to keep that, that pace. Very good. So, so let me get started. So my talk today is going to be about the ADS-CFT correspondence. And, and what the ADS-CFT correspondence states is the following. It says that there's a duality between a conformal field theory um, living in D space-time dimensions uh, and a theory of quantum gravity living in anti de Sitter space in D plus one dimension in D plus one dimensions. And the statement of the ADS-CFT correspondence is that there's really an equality between the two partition functions. Uh, and on the left-hand side here, this is the partition function of the CFT, namely the generating function for all correlated correlation functions of the conformal field theory. Uh, on the right-hand side here, we have somewhat of a complicated object because um, this is also the generating function for, for, for correlation functions um, in anti de Sitter space, but this is in a theory of quantum gravity, which typically, um, let's say um, in the most canonical example, like n equals four super Yang mills being dual to string theory. Um, and here we really have type two B string theory on ADS5 cross S5. Now, of course, string theory is a very complicated theory of quantum gravity, um, but in the usual parameter regime um, that we like, which is you know, when the CFT has a large number of degrees of freedom um, and that it's strongly coupled, then this, uh, this ADS side of the duality, this, this quantum gravity side simplifies and admits a description uh, in terms of a low energy effective field theory. Uh, and what we really mean is that, you know, string theory has many, many fields. Um, there's massive modes with the mass of order of the string scale, and then there's the massless sector. Uh, and in the low energy limit, the only thing you keep is the massless sector. Um, and this, this low energy EFT is just, then just becomes semi-classical general relativity. Okay, where lambda is the cosmological constant. Uh, and in general, it's not just pure general relativity. There's also a certain number of matter fields. And really, typically, we have supergravity rather than general relativity. And I'll include schematically uh, the, the supergravity part of the action in S matter. So, Alexander, and, I have a question. Yes. So, when uh, you um, uh, mentioned that the EFT contains both gravity and matter, so once you are doing the partition function, so writing the partition function, so you have to uh, path integrate of, over G mu nu as well. Yes, correct. Yeah. So, but how to do that particularly? 
Right. So, so you're you're absolutely right. Thanks. This is a great question. So, you know, really, what what I should be writing here is h mu nu, d h mu nu, where we have in mind that you know the full metric is equal to the background piece. Let's say just vacuum ADS metric plus a small perturbation h mu nu. Okay. Okay. Uh, and of course, we don't know how to do this path integral non perturbatively in h mu nu. Mm -hmm. um, but we know how to do it perturbatively, and, and we also know, so what I'll discuss below actually will sort of answer your question. Um, mm, sure. But you're absolutely sure. right. We should be doing the path integral over metrics as well. Sure. Great, thanks. Um, so, you know, a very natural type of question to ask is, well, given this low energy eff effective field theory in terms of Einstein gravity or supergravity, what what can you calculate with it? What part of the CFT dynamics can you extract just from this low energy EFT? And that's going to be sort of uh, the central question trying to driving my talk today. You know, so what part of the CFT dynamics can we extract with um, SEFT. Okay, and what I'll do is I'll sort of describe um, what we know, what we know about this question, and sort of increasing step in steps of sort of increasing complexity. Uh, and the first step is what I would call standard effective field theory. Hello, uh, Professor yes. Aiden, may I ask a question? Yes, please, yes. Uh, so uh, you are focusing on low energy scale. Is that because we already know the general relativity part, classical, I mean, semi-classical gravity part? That's why you want to see that uh, uh, low energy scale matches with semi-classical part? And what about the high energy part? That, that's what I want to know. Right, so the, the idea is the following is that, you know, we have multiple scales in the problem. So there's the ADS scale, which is basically, you know, one over lambda or one over square root of lambda. Um, then there's also a string scale in ADS5 cross S5, right? Um, and we know that, um, oops, sorry about that. And we know that the string scale is much smaller than the ADS scale, right? right? So what we imagine is we, we imagine putting our cutoff, say, somewhere around here. We squeeze, it, we squeeze it in the middle. So our UV cutoff you know, is below all the stringy states, uh, but you know, much bigger than the ADS scale. Uh, and then we do effective field theory with a cutoff of that scale. Okay. So what we're supposed to do is throw away all the stringy modes, integrate everything out, and we're only left with the massless sector because those are the only fields that appear at this scale. Um, and then, and that's, how we're, that's how we're thinking about the effective field theory. Okay. And of course, I didn't write it, but there's yet another scale, which is the Planck scale, which is even smaller. Sorry, I wrote it the, I wrote it the other way around. Of course, this is sorry. The biggest scale is the, the biggest length scale is uh, the ADS scale, which is much bigger than the length scale of the cutoff, much bigger than the string scale, then much bigger than the Planck scale. Okay. The, does that help? Yes, yes, it's fine. Great. So we are, we are considering only the uh, uh, gravity part. I mean, that's right. Uh, we're not going to the singularity part to, 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 to deep into the singularity, right? No, for now, there's no black holes or anything like that. Well, well so I'll, I'll describe this more precisely in a second. Okay, fine. fine. So Great. one more thing I have, uh, like I want to ask. So choosing the cutoff of the theory above the Planck scale is not harming anything with the effective field theory, because mostly people talk about the fact that your theory should be valid up to Planck scale. And right. Like so, so typically, you know, you can sort of ask, uh, uh, how how small can I make this cutoff while keeping control over the theory in a theory of quantum gravity, mm -hmm. and. Um, the answer depends a little bit on the setting. If you're in this regime that I wrote down here, if you're in this, this green regime here, I think this is the safest thing to do. 
Okay. Um, sometimes it happens that you don't have a string scale. For example, if you're an M theory, you don't have a string scale. And then you might hope that you can push the cutoff all the way to the Planck scale. Okay. And I think what everybody expects is that, you know, the Planck scale is the best you can ever do. Because if you try to put your cutoff further than the Planck scale, well, you know that there are black holes and you know that there are new objects in your theory that you cannot neglect. Sure. So, um, so yes, when people say, you know, typically the cutoff is the Planck scale is it, what they really mean is sort of the best possible cutoff you can imagine is the Planck scale. Here I'm being even more cautious. I'm saying I'm still going to keep it parametrically separated from the Planck scale just to be safe. And sometimes you can do better. Okay. Yeah, great. These are great questions. Um, good. So, so standard EFT. So what do we do? So we can take ESEFT, um, and as I was saying in, before, you can expand fields um, around a background. Which means that you know you can take phi goes to phi bar plus delta phi. The metric, we do the same for the metric, meaning that we write uh, the ADS metric plus perturbations. Um, and then we can expand this EFT. So I wrote down a full a nonlinear action for SEFT, uh, but really what you should think about it is expanding it around some background, which in this case is just the ADS background, and, and considering an effective field theory for the, the perturbations H mu nu. Uh, and then from this effective field theory, you can start computing you know, what you would do in, in standard EFTs, compute you know, a few low point correlation functions. So for example, if you had some, some scalar phi in ADS, which is dual to a CFT operator O, you could compute four point functions of O, um, let's say O1, O2, O3, O4, um, and to leading order, so this would be given in ADS by Witten diagrams, and to leading order, you would just have, um, you know, the disconnected contributions. And then you would have interactions. And then you would also have loops at higher orders uh, and so on and so forth. And this is something uh, that you can do with your low energy effective field theory. In some sense, it's you know, uh, the bread and butter of what low energy EFT does. Uh, and from this, you can compute, you know, these Witten diagrams or compute the CFT correlators. Again, you can ask, well, what part of the CFT uh, dynamics am I getting? And it turns out that here there's an exact map between um, SCFT, the, pr the parameters appearing in your low energy effective field theory, like the masses of the fields or the, the couplings um, and the data of the conformal field theory. And by the data of the conformal field theory, I mean a list of operator, operator scaling dimensions, delta of O, uh, and OPE coefficients. And these you can get in the one over N expansion. And the important part here is that this is exact. You know, you give me the low energy EFT, you compute these Witten diagrams, you can compute them exactly. And then from these Witten diagrams, you extract exactly these parameters. And now these parameters can may themselves not be exact, but sort of have a one over n expansion, but you can compute the coefficients in this one over n ex expansion exactly. So okay, and this is- I have a question, yes. Alexander. For three yeah. point, we know that how to fix the coefficient. It, it's like very, but four point you have to like, uh, like uh, you write things in terms of the conformal blocks. Uh, and yes. Like cross ratios. But yes. What you mean. So, so that's a great question. So so you know here, really what you're getting is because this is a this is a, a full function of space time, right? So you know you can fix say three of these points, but the fourth one will still um, be at some location that you can move around, so you get a function's worth. Mm -hmm. And really what that means is that the, the operators that you extract, the scaling dimensions and, and OPE coefficients, you don't extract just one number, you extract a, an infinite family of numbers 
from the multi-trace operators. So there's other operators that are called O squared and K, oops, O, O um, and K, which, which basically means something like, O, you know, there's D mu, D mu to the yes. N, and then D mu one, D mu K, O. Uh, you extract the, the scaling dimensions of these operators uh, and also the OPE coefficients, C, O, O, and then O, O, and K. So this is what you extract. And really, as you said, uh, there's, there's, a, there's conformal blocks. There's a whole function's worth of these, these correlation functions. And so you need an infinite number of operators to contribute. And these are the operators that contribute, these ones here. So you know, if you compute a four-point function at tree-level order, you can extract all these numbers so you can extract the conformal dimension of these operators and the OPE coefficients, and you extract those exactly. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Great. And I just want to know one more thing. Yeah. <clears throat> like, particularly in the, this direction, the conformal bootstrap worked very perfectly for particularly four point and all. Exactly. Can you mention about this thing a little bit? Yeah, so this is, you know, part, a lot of the progress in the conformal bootstrap has been making this, here I talk about a map, right? Uh, and a, lot, a, a big part of the progress in the conformal bootstrap has been making this map as efficient as possible. So okay. the bootstrap has, you know, developed a technology telling you how to go from the value of the correlator to the, the, the data that you want to extract in the CFT and, and back and forth. Yeah, um, and in some sense, so the conformal bootstrap has has developed this map between parameters in the low energy effective field theory and um, conformal data in the CFT. Yeah, so some people from India actually try to interpret as Melin amplitudes, uh, Melin bootstrap. Probably you know. Yes. This. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. This thing. yeah. Yeah. So the Melin bootstrap is just you know. It's, slight, it's, it's a different way to organize the bootstrap problem mm -hmm. um, where, where you make uh, crossing invariance manifest, but not unitarity. Yes. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, I'd say that the, the fundamental physics problem or even the fundamental math problem um, is the same, but it's just a different trick to or, of how you organize things. Yes. Um, and it's, it's very natural from the point of view of ADS-CFT because Mellon amplitudes have a sort of direct resonance with wind diagrams in the bulk. Yes, yes. So, right, so so this is all, you know, this is a huge body of work from, from tens and if not hundreds of people over the last, I don't know, five to 10 years and trying to understand how to do this better. Um, but the, the, the main message here is that this can be done and we know how to do it now and we can do it exactly. So, 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 okay. So at this level, when you ask what can the low energy EFT compute, well, it can compute all this CFT data and the one over N expansion, exactly. So that's great. But now we're going to move on to the second step. And typically, when we talk about what we can do with ADS CFT, we don't just talk about expanding the metric perturbatively about around the ADS background. We also take this low energy EFT, we take the Einstein-Hilbert action, and then we look for classical nonlinear solution to the equations of motion. And the thing that we've done um, the most with this type of idea is to consider black holes. And this I'd say is already sort of beyond uh, standard EFT. Okay, and so what we imagine here is that we, 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 we look for you know, um, full nonlinear classical solutions uh, to the equations of motion of SEFT. Um, and then we compute the CFT partition function using the ADS CFT dictionary saying that that's approximated by the on-shell action of the gravity solution. Um, and we can extract many things from this, the most famous of which we we all know is the Bekenstein-Hawking formula for black hole entropy, um, which is the following. And you know the Bekenstein. If you imagine writing this as the the mass of the black hole or as a function of the energy of the black hole, 
then really you can think that what we're computing is a density of states given by the bulk theory, um, which is just the exponential of the entropy. Uh, but already here, there's something a little bit more interesting to say than before is that this is no longer exact. Because what you compute in gravity is a continuous function of the energy. It's the Bekenstein Hawking formula, which is a continuous function of mass. Whereas we, we know that the conformal field theory uh, really has a discrete spectrum. Any conformal field theory, if you put it on you know, a compact space, like on a three sphere, it has a discrete spectrum of energy eigenstates. And we're only seeing this continuous function. So what's happening is that there's really some coarse graining. Uh, and really you should think about the following, what the, the gravity um, theory computes is some you know, smooth function of E bar, the, the energy, um, but you should really think that this comes from integrating the actual CFT density of states um, in some energy window which you know, in some typical thermodynamical setting you can take to be the microcanonical window, for example, right? So really, the, as I said, the CFT density of states um, is equal to a sum over delta functions, is a sum over delta functions. Um, but when you integrate that over a sufficiently large window centered at E bar, then you produce a smooth function of E bar. And this smooth function is really what the, the gravitational theory is capturing. Okay, so already here, we, we see that things are a bit more complicated. We don't extract exactly the, the, the exact values of the EIs here, but only some sort of integrated version, some integra integrated form of, these, of this density of states. Um, and once you have the black hole background, you can do a lot more. You can compute, for example, and a two point. I have yes. I can yes. understand that uh, how this is implementing, but can you uh, motivate a little bit more that why uh, particularly this type of course graining is required to cutting this bulk and CFT? Yeah, good. So uh, I'm not sure required is really the right word. I think, you know, I wouldn't say this is even sort of firmly established, but I think this is a little bit the intuition that we have on what's happening. Okay. Is that you know um, you're you're there? What's the best way to say this? Um, you compute something in gravity and you get a smooth function of the energy. Mm -hmm. And now the question is, okay, that's a statement. You get a smooth function of the energy in gravity. Um, what could that possibly what could that possibly mean in the CFT? Yes. And, and and in the CFT, it's pretty clear that it means something like this. And you know. True. This is at this stage, I would say this is even just thermodynamics or statistical mechanics. You know, when we say we measure the energy of a gas in a room, mm -hmm. well, we're obviously not measuring the, the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian on the quantum mechanical system, but we're averaging, we're, we're calculating some sort of average over many configurations. Um, yeah, and so, some ensemble leverage or something like that. Yeah, we're, we're exactly. So, so it, in some ensemble, we're, we're computing, you know, the, the entropy of some ensemble. And this is exactly what's happening here. We're summing over what would be the microcanonical ensemble, you know, mm -hmm. all states, all states of the quantum system within some energy window. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what we're capturing. And this is now a smooth function of this energy window. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Great questions. Um, but as I was saying, once you have the black hole as a solution, you can do more than just compute it, its entropy. So here's some black hole geometry. You can also probe the black hole with other operators. For example, you can look at the two-point function uh, of a CFT operator O on the black hole background. Um, and so one nice thing to compute is the two-point function at Lorentzian time separation in the thermal state. So this would be a two-point function on the black hole background. Um, and you can compute that in gravity, so as a function of time. And what you'll get is something like this. You'll get a curve that starts off and that decays and it decays to zero. And the fact that this curve is decaying is really sort of thermalization in the, a, this is sort of describing thermalization and it's related to the quasi-normal behavior of, of perturbations on top of the black hole. 
But it turns out that we know that in any theory with a discrete spectrum, this cannot be the right curve. And this was pointed out by Malasena, um, I guess close to 20 years ago, and is a version of the information paradox is that, you know, in any theory um, with a discrete spectrum, once you reach, once you reach uh, a size here, which is e to the minus the entropy, uh, really the discreteness of the spectrum. So the, this coarse graining that we did sort of forgot about the discreteness of the spectrum, but at very, very late times, once the signal has decayed enough, um, really the system remembers that there's discrete eigenvalues and what's expected is this thing will start to, um, you know, chaotic, there's gonna be some chaotic behavior with erratic oscillations uh, and that continue forever and that, that you know, are of order e to the minus s, the level spacing of the eigenvalues. Okay, and this, this, this crazy erratic signal here, this is something you cannot capture. Um, just from the black hole background. Very good. Um, but as I said here, you know, we're already way beyond EFT. We're already capturing, you know, we're using the low energy EFT to look at classical nonlinear solutions to the equations of motion. Um, but now we reach the third step, and this is really where all the exciting progress has been happening over the last couple of years. Um, so, Alex, Alex, yes. The last oscillating behavior is this somewhere connected to quantum chaos or something like that? Absolutely, yes. This is connected to quantum chaos, and you know, I'm drawing this curve, but we have not computed this curve, and we expect it to be of this type from very general arguments of quantum chaos. Yeah, because like the saturation at the late time is basically uh, like uh, with uh, the Lyapunov quantum Lyapunov exponent or yeah, so you can connect with that. I think. Yeah, so this is I, I would say this is a slightly different probe of quantum chaos than what the Lyapunov exponent probes. Yeah, true. That probes scrambling, and here this is more about discreteness of the of the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Yeah. Um, but both of them are probes of quantum chaos, and and yes, this is the I regime we've, we've entered. The regime. I want to point, point one more thing because the yes. similar kind of behavior also observed in random matrix theory as well. That's right, and I'll come to that in just a second. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, very good. So now let me come to the, the to the to the third part, and it's precisely about connecting with the, with these ideas of quantum chaos. And so the the third the third type of objects that you can compute now with this low low energy EFT is to consider wormholes or Euclidean wormholes. Okay, and this is really way beyond effective field theory, and it has to do with discreteness of the spectrum. And so I talked about the thermal two-point function, but there's a very uh, similar quantity, which is called the spectral form factor, which is just the analytically continued uh, square of the partition function. So you take a partition function, you analytically continue it in temperature, beta goes to beta plus it, and then you take the complex conjugate, you multiply the two. Um, and so what does this thing look like? What does this f of t look like as a function of t? And again, here we're drawing our intuition from, from quantum chaos. Um, so this starts off and then decays, just like the two-point function. Then there's a dip. And then this is the place where it starts to have this crazy erratic oscillation. Um, and then it oscillates around some value, which again is of order e to the minus s. Um, and in a beautiful paper by Saad, Schenker, and Stanford, what they showed is that actually, um, in the context of JT gravity, so in two-dimensional gravity, um, you can catch, capture this feature here, which is the, called the ramp. You can cap capture it by considering contributions to the Euclidean path integral, uh, which is given by this Euclidean wormhole here that extrapolates between two circles. So you know, you imagine here you compute z, z of beta, z of beta prime. Um, and you look at these wormhole geometries and you take into account their contribution and you reproduce this ramp here. 
And more precisely, you don't really reproduce the exact erratic ramp, but you reproduce sort of the linear, the average of this signal, which has some linear increase here in the ramp. Okay, and so the idea here is that still using e SEFT. I have one more question here. Yes. When this ramp kind of behavior uh, they have obtained, is they uh, like uh, assumed any kind of Gaussian unitary and ensemble type of thing? No. So in this particular case, they didn't assume anything. They were able to just compute the gravitational path integral in JT gravity. Okay. Um, and they found that this ramp exists. It, it, indeed, you're right that this ramp is related to the two point level statistics of the density of states. Yes. Um, and in some sense, it's, in all theories, it's there. And then there's very interesting questions about higher point level statistics of rho, uh, which in principle you could extract as well. Um, but you're right, the ramp is sort of the Gaussian piece, mm -hmm. if you want. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, so, so, so this low energy EFT captures some universal um, signal of quantum chaos. But this is really sort of way beyond our wildest dreams because this is really something that's sensitive to the discrete nature um, of, to the discrete nature of black hole microsticks. And I should say that um, this is related um, to all the recent progress on obtaining the deriving a, a unitary page curve. Because in that context, um, the types of geometries that you need to, to sum over are also Euclidean wormhole. In that case, they have a special name called replica wormholes. Um, and it's sort of the consideration of these types of geometries uh, that give you, um, you know, uh, a page curve for a black hole evaporation compatible with unitarity. So the message here is that somehow, you know, the low energy effective field theory of gravity is much more powerful than what we had anticipated before. Maybe it can't give you the exact erratic signal of quantum chaos, but things like its average or its variance are the types of things that it seems to be able to compute. And that's really incredibly powerful. Unfortunately, there's a price to pay. And in fact, here I took a route which is um, in some sense um, backwards in terms of the, the historical route that wormholes followed because before realizing that, black, that, that wormholes were very powerful, uh, we were very confused about wormholes. And this is due to a factorization problem. Um, put forward by Miles and Maldacena. And the problem is the following. Imagine you want to compute a product of CFT partition functions on two disconnected manifolds. For example, the product of thermal partition functions. Well, you can go and compute this in gravity. And in gravity, what you're supposed to do is, you know, put here are your two CFT disconnected circles. And you're supposed to look at all the gravitational geometries that have these two boundaries as their right uh, asymptotic boundaries. So this fixes the, the, the boundary conditions for the gravity path integral. And in particular, there, there are wormholes geometry of this type that exists. And then if you compute the onshell action of these geometries, you'll get some function of beta and beta prime. Uh, but it, this function here will not be equal to a direct factorized product between two other functions, f, of, f twiddle of beta and f twiddle of beta prime. And this is a contradiction with the fact that in a CFT, if you compute the product of partition functions, well, it just manifestly, uh, it just manifestly factorizes. So if you take this at face value, you might tend to believe there's a problem with the ADS CFT duality because you compute something in gravity and it doesn't have the same structure as what you've computed in the CFT. Um, okay, so this is a puzzle. Um, and, and the goal of my talk today is to try to give a framework, um, you know, that's compatible with computing all three sort of, all three aspects um, of what the low energy 
EFT can of, of what the low energy EFT um, is capable of, of calculating. Uh, and also try to understand a little bit um, how this fits in with the problem of factorization. And see how this fits in with the problem of factorization. Very good. So um, this was my introduction. Let me just quickly go over the outline for my talk. This was my introduction. Uh, I'm going to first start by um, introducing a framework called the OP randomness hypothesis, which is a conjecture that we formulated. But really, uh, it's kind of an extension of the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So I'll start by really reviewing what ETH is. Um, and then I'll discuss two applications. Um, the first one is the genus two wormhole, which was one of these confusing wormholes um, discussed by Miles and Maldacena. Uh, and then I'll, we'll see also a little bit how time goes, but then I'll discuss another application, which is how to use these wormholes to get an argument against global symmetries in quantum gravity. So in connection with this ETH, I yeah. just point that, uh, like you know probably, uh, Mark Shrednicki have written a paper uh, regarding this, uh, like connection with chaos, how to explain what is the role of against a thermalization hypothesis? Do you, do you mean his more recent paper from let's say yeah, two or yeah. three years ago yes. about uh, like the chaos bound and Lyapunov exponents? Yes. And, yes. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question, and I, I will I'll address it in a little bit. It's actually pretty important for what I'll discuss today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll I'll discuss that in a little bit of detail, yeah, just in, I guess, a slide or two. Um, but yeah, very good. Before I get started, um, are there any other questions? Not from me. Thanks. OK. I was just uh, giving you time to ask them. But if not, let me dive in. So let me start by reviewing the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So if you take uh, a many buddy quantum chaotic system, um, we expect um, it to have certain universal features. And one of these universal features is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And it states the following. If you consider, again, this many body system and you consider a simple operator. So for example, if you had a spin chain and you look at an operator with, which just ha is, has support on you know, a few sites, um, and you look at it between, you look at its matrix um, element between two energy eigenstates, which are very high energy in the thermodynamic limit, then we expect this thing to have a universal structure. And let me just write down all the different quantities and then I'll tell you what they are. Okay, so what is everything that I wrote here? So E bar is the average energy. So it's just EI plus EJ over two. Omega is the energy difference. Um, FA and GA are smooth functions um, of their arguments. Um, what else do I need to define? And the RIJs, um, those are erratic random variables. with um, unit variance and zero mean. And FA and GA are related to the microeconomical one point and two point functions of the operator O. So what does ETH tell you? It tells you that if you take a, a quantum chaotic system, a quantum many body chaotic system, and you look at the matrix elements of simple operators and energy eigenstates, well, it's basically all the diagonal. And on the diagonal, you have the microcanonical expectation value. And then the off-diagonal elements um, are, crazy, are, crazingly, are crazingly oscillating um, because of this function Rij here. 
And also really, I should say that usually when you write the ETH written down, you write it slightly differently. You write it in the, the following way. Um, and so really this function G is exponentially suppressed. So the idea is that these matrix elements, well, they're mostly diagonal with the microcanonical expectation value. And then the off diagonals are exponentially small. They're crazingly os rapidly oscillating. There are these erratic numbers Rij. Um, and then there's still some sort of smooth part of that multiplying it, which is this function G, which encodes, which is basically the Fourier transform of the microcanonical two point function. Okay, and this is supposed to be extremely universal. This should be true from, from a chaotic spin chain, you know, um, to the 3D Ising model to n equals to four super Yankels. Um, no matter what system you consider, it should have this general structure. Now, there's two comments that I should make. And one of them will be related to what Santan was just mentioning earlier. Um, the first one is that um, in any fixed theory, so if you just hand me a chaotic Hamiltonian, um, Rij are actual numbers. Meaning you can, in principle, diagonalize the Hamiltonian. You can, in principle, solve the theory. Um, and you can compute these coefficients, and you'd find values. They're just they're or, order one numbers um, with no particular sign. But um, you could go and, and solve for them, in principle. But the idea is that, in practice, you can treat them as random variables um, for many practical purposes, you can treat them as random random variables with a certain probability distribution. And that means that their mean is zero and that their variance is one. Okay, and for many practical purposes, this is enough. But it's important to remember that they're not actual random variables. In any given theory, they take specific values. It's just that it's very, it's very sensitive information on the Hamiltonian that it's hard to access if you don't solve the theory exactly. So for practical purposes, let's treat them as random variables. And in this talk today, I'm going to treat, I'm going to call these things quasi-random variables. Very good. And the second comment, and this is related to what to what Zayantan was saying earlier, is that um, although people sometimes say, say this, Rij are not Gaussian. You know, so even though they have zero mean and a unit variance, they're actually not Gaussian. And for example, the ETH ANSATS guarantees you that you correctly reproduce thermal one-point and two-point functions. But if you wanted to reproduce a four-point function, for example, to compute an OTOC, an out-of-time ordered correlator, to reproduce a four-point function, you would need some fourth moment, ROP, uh, connected to be non-trivial. Okay, so in principle, these Rij's, they have higher moments in their probability distribution. And for example, they would have a non-trivial quartic moment. Okay, so when we say that they're, they're Gaussian, that's really uh, to leading order. Um, and uh, they really have an, a non-Gaussian, if you really wanted to reproduce higher order correlation functions, they would really have also non-Gaussian um, parts of their distribution. Good. Any question related to this? If not, let me continue. So this was just a general statement uh, about quantum chaotic system, but you can ask, what does ETH mean in a conformal field theory? Um, and there's one difference in a conformal field theory. Uh, I guess I'll often write it like this just to be. Um, yeah, I have. I want to ask one question regarding your yes. video statement. Maybe it's not directly uh, connected, but I just suddenly think like since you are talking about these non Gaussian uh, quantities, uh, like having non Gaussian moments. Uh, is there is any connection with uh, this like uh, this Fokker Planck dynamics and all because there people used to talk about this non-Gaussian moments. 
and this used to say that the, the all these kind of fluctuations and things will be basically uh, the non gaussianities are showing if you calculate the higher order moments is, is, is it kind of connection some, some so i missed the word that you said is it is this connected to what focal plant dynamics oh i'm not super familiar with that actually um it, it might be it might be I'm, I'm not completely sure yeah i don't think i can give you an answer in real time yeah okay um but yeah i if i had to bet i would say that it is yeah um, good. So, so what's new in conformal field theories is there's something called the state operator correspondence, which says that any state in the Hilbert space um, can be can be written as um, a local operator, or maybe linear combinations of local operators acting on the CFT vacuum. So, in other words, the the one point function of an operator between energy eigenstates um, is really a, a three point function in the vacuum. Or in other words, an OPE coefficient, because that's what a three-point function in the vacuum is. Uh, but these three operators are somewhat different. The, the, the simple operator, the probe operator, is a light operator, meaning that um, you know, the, the scaling dimension, its scaling dimension is fixed, and say order one and fixed in the thermodynamic limit, whereas OI and OJ, they're heavy operators meaning that delta i or j goes to infinity in the thermodynamic limit. Very good. Um, so, so, um, so really, you know, uh, the OPE, the, the ETH, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, is a statement about OPE coefficients where two of the operators are heavy and one of the operator is light. But of course, then it's very natural to ask, well, what happens when one of the operators is heavy and two of them are light, or even when three, all three operators are heavy? So this is heavy, light, light, and this is heavy, heavy, heavy. What can we say about these? Oh, sorry. Uh, excuse me. Uh, yeah. What do you mean by heavy operator or light operator? Uh, I mean that the the scaling dimension, the conformal dimension of the operator, is going to uh, infinity in the thermodynamic limit. So, so these are operators with scaling dimension becoming very, very large. Okay. Okay. Those are heavy operators. Yeah, they're they're heavy. Yeah, that's what that's what okay. I mean. Heavy is that their scaling dimension is is very very big. Okay. So, so this is a state, ETH is a statement about two about the OPE coefficients when two of the operators become very, very heavy, whereas one of them stays light, order one, say. Um, and, but now you can ask, well, what about these, what about these other two operators? What about these other two OPE coefficients? Okay, and this is, leads me to the OP randomness hypothesis. Um, that we introduced with Jan. Which states the following in a chaotic CFT. Um, we have the following property is that these OPE coefficients light, light, heavy, uh, and heavy, 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 are also described by quasi-random variables. Um, so in particular, these Ri and Rj, Rijk are quasi-random variables. Uh, with zero mean and unit variance. Okay, and um, in 2D CFTs, so this is, you can think about this as a generalization of ETH, and in 2D CFTs, something, um, there was already some sort of, a um, little bit of evidence for this, and it came out in a paper by Collier 
uh, Maloney, Maxfield, and Sierras. Um, and what the authors realized is that you, you can actually extract these functions FAB here. So these functions FAB and F are related to the variance of these quasi-random variables. Um, and you can extract these functions. They're fixed in all 2D CFTs. And this one you can extract by looking at four point functions on the plane and using crossing. And this one here by looking at the genus two partition function and using modular invariance. Um, and um, so these functions you can actually extract. And in fact, there's some technology for 2D CFTs, which is the, the, the crossing kernel. Um, and it really enables you to get these two things, but also sort of the ETH part um, um, and extract these functions, which uh, are called asymptotic formulas for OPE coefficients, um, which you can think about is controlling the, the variance of, of these functions. And just to give you an example for F of for, for F. So when all three conformal dimensions, I, J, K on, are the same, uh, you get some function of this type, which you should view as uh, a generalized Cardi formula. Okay, so this is the sum over I, J, and K, C, I, J, K squared. So these, these, these functions that control the variance, you can extract them. Okay, so this is this is our conjecture: is that this the statistical distribution of OPE coefficients is true, and now you can ask, what does this have to do with ADS-CFT and holography? And our proposal is that the OPE randomness hypothesis uh, is equivalent to the Euclidean path integral. Uh, of semi-classical GR. And what we mean by that is that semi-classical GR cannot resolve the actual values of the OPE coefficients, um, but it can treat heavy operators or black hole microstates statistically. So if you, if you imagine trying, so, so imagine you're trying to compute some OPE coefficients, okay, as a function of their index i, which I'm schematically labeling by i, we expect, you know, in the CFT, this is a chaotic theory. So these OPE coefficients have all kinds of crazy erratic behavior. There's all these numbers with crazy erratic behavior. Um, and of course, GR cannot resolve these actual numbers. But what GR can do, what the semi-classical path integral of GR can do, is compute, you know, the mean of the signal, or, you know, the variance of the signal. And compute moments of the distribution. Of the CI. But of course, um, since it treats the OPE coefficient statistically, it makes a mistake. Um, and what we'll see in a little bit is that this mistake is related to the appearance of these wormholes. Okay, so GR makes a mistake. Um, and this mistake is related to the appearance of wormholes. Very good. But are there any questions about the OP randomness hypothesis uh, and what our interpretation is for holography? Okay, if not, um, let me continue. So now I'm gonna move on to the first application. which is the genus two wormhole. Uh, 
Um, so there's a particular Euclidean wormhole that um, was given in Maus and Maldacena, which stretches between two asymptotic boundaries of a 2D CFT. Uh, and in fact, it's so simple that I can just write the metric for you here in real time. So the metric is the following. Sigma G is the constant negative curvature metric on a genus two surface. And then the wormhole geometry is give, just given by this three metric here. Um, and you would expect this wormhole to contribute um, if you're trying to compute something like the product of genus two partition functions in a two dimensional conformal field theory. Again, if you're trying to compute something like this in gravity, well, you would expect that you would first have a, a disconnected contribution where you look at geometries that fill in this genus two surface here. Right? Uh, but then you'd also have a connected contribution given by the wormhole. So now I'm doing the Euclidean path integral of gravity with these boundary conditions. I'm looking at all metrics that asymptote to two, two genus two surfaces. There's first cases where you just take the two surfaces and you fill each of them in. But there's also another configuration where there's some connection between the two genus two geometries through the Euclidean wormhole. And you can compute the on-shell action of both of these things in the high temperature limit. And you get the following expression. Okay, where I've used the mapping between G Newton and L ADS and the central charge of the CFT. Uh, and it's important to know that you get a one here because the on-shell action of the genus two geometry vanishes. Uh, but, but really this one here is what would be responsible for the lack of factorization. Okay, so if I had put different moduli here on the top and on the bottom, then here, so if I had done this, let me do it in red. In that case, the, the metric is just is harder to write down. You can't just write down a simple metric for it, but this thing would have been replaced by a function of beta and beta prime. That does not factorize. Okay, so, so this little one here, you should think of as an, as an avatar for the lack of factorization. So now the question is, can we reproduce uh, this in the CFT? Um, but first, I need to tell you in a conformal field theory how to compute the genus two partition function. So what we do is we sum over three copies of the CFT states. We insert the OPE coefficient squared. And then at least for simple slices of, of the moduli of the Riemann surface, um, we put a Boltzmann factor here with the, the sum of all three conformal dimensions. So this is a little bit like a generalization of the finite temperature partition function where you have a Boltzmann factor here with three energies, uh, but they're weighted by OPE coefficient squared. Now, obviously, if we just compute the genus two partition function on two disconnected uh, space times in the CFT, and we do this microscopically, uh, well, we'll never reproduce what we get in gravity. Because we got this non-factorizing piece in the gravitational answer, whereas microscopically, you'll just clearly factorize into two things um, that clearly factorize. Uh, but what we're going to do is the following. Um, we're going to not compute it microscopically in the CFT, but we're going to compute it using the OP randomness hypothesis. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so let me make sure I have enough space here. So let me write that. So you have some sum over many different indices. And then you have a bunch of Kronecker deltas um, that are ensuring that the traces are taken in the right way. PS delta QT. Uh, then you have these OPE coefficients. Uh, and then you have this Boltzmann factor. 
with all six conformal dimensions. Okay, and even though I wrote this formula here uh, on you know one line, uh, it's very clear that you can just separate this thing into two things that factorize. Okay, but now I'm not going to compute this exactly. I'm going to compute this using the OP randomness hypothesis. Let me not put it in red here because I'm going to need to distinguish between red and green in just a second. And as I said, these OPE coefficients, these heavy, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients, they have a statistical distribution and the leading behavior is a Gaussian. And a Gaussian just means that you're doing weight contractions. And so there's one weight contraction that you can do, which is just obvious, which is to contract the OPE coefficients in this way. Uh, and then you'll get the following answer. You'll get this red piece, and this is again just sort of like the square of the genus two part of a single copy of the genus two partition function. Um, but there's also another weight contraction, which is taking this OPE coefficient and contracting it with this one, and this one with this one. And if you do that, you can see that there's no longer a saddle point um, in in these these sums over the conformal dimensions, and you just get an order one function that I'm going to call one. And this is going to be the green. This is going to be the green piece here. And, um, and again, this one is really what's responsible for the lack of factorization had we picked different moduli beta and beta prime. OK? And so what we seem to see is that we reproduce the gravitational answer. Uh, and in particular, we would have no, we have no factorization. OK, very good. Uh, this was my first application to, um, to the OP randomness hypothesis. Um, and let me maybe just stop and see if there are any questions before I move to the second part. Hopefully, this wasn't too quick. Yeah, this is very clear to me. If OK, great. Please yes. Ask. If not, you can proceed then. Okay, no other questions. Great. So now let me come to the second application. And it's going to be to give an argument that there are no global symmetries in quantum gravity. So of course there are old arguments of why we believe this to be true because if you you know take a black hole you throw some some matter in with some that's charged under some global symmetry uh, and then you wait until it falls into the black hole all information about the global symmetry will be lost and so when the black hole evaporates then um, you know you'll you'll have the the chart the global charge will have disappeared uh, and this is like an old argument for why global symmetries should not exist in quantum gravity. Uh, but what I want to do here is, is show how wormholes seem to be smart enough to know that. Uh, and the idea is the following. Consider a low energy EFT um, in ADS, which, is, which has a global symmetry with a global symmetry. So, no, so you know, you can imagine that your effective field theory is just the Einstein-Hilbert theory. Um, plus a matter um, um, plus just a, a complex, I should write this, plus a complex scalar field. OK, so this has a U1 global symmetry. Uh, and now imagine that you take for example, our favorite genus two wormhole, and you compute the two point function of the boundary operator dual to phi o q o minus q. Um, well, you can just compute this thing with the geometry and you'll find something that is non zero. You'll just get some some answer, some non-zero answer. But remember that the intuition from what the wormhole computes is really the variance 
of certain quantities. Okay, so what we're computing this computes the variance of one point functions inserted on a genus two surface. But now there's a paradox. Because in quantum field theory, the one point function of a charged operator on any compact surface has to be equal to zero. Okay, this is the, the easiest way to see this is, for example, at finite temperature. Um, this thing is just the sum over I, I, O, Q, I, e to the minus beta, E, I. Now the bra and the ket of I each have opposite charge. Uh, and so if OQ is charged, then you have a problem with charge conservation. So this thing is just zero in every individual term here. So the whole thing vanishes. Okay, and the same thing is true on the genus two surface or on a sphere or, or are any other compact surface. Okay, but this is very confusing because I told you that, you know, the wormhole is capturing, you know, the variance of certain erratic signals. Um, but here there's no erratic signal. The charge one point function is just exactly zero, flat zero. So there's no variance and we're seeing that there's a not, but we're seeing a non-zero answer for the variance. So what's going on? So this is a paradox and there's sort of two possible resolutions. So um, once you compute this uh, average value uh, at finite temperature, this is just a usual thermal state. Uh, for example, here, yes. So yes. Yeah, but if it is thermophile double, then what is the thing? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So this is a good question. Um, so let me let me take a minute here. So we're not computing the you know we're not computing this. You you can do the thermal field double state, right? Which is a black a Lorentzian black hole, and compute O Q here, and O minus Q here, right? Okay. And this is non-zero, and that's okay. That's not a paradox to anything, mm -hmm. because real because really what's happening here, if you think about this as a Euclidean correlator. It's really a two-point function on a torus. And yeah. there's OQ on one side and O minus Q on the other side. And so the total charge on the compact surface is zero. Oh, okay. So this is OK. But we're doing something different here, right? We're taking a torus here. We're putting OQ. And then we're doing a Euclidean wormhole mm. and no. putting O minus Q, right? Yes. And so the, the, to, the total charge on the entire geometry is zero. So that, that's okay. That's why gravity gives that this is non-zero. The problem is that on each individual boundary, we have a non-vanishing charge. Hmm. And that's not allowed. Yes. So, so this, is, this is the puzzle. Um, and so um, there's two possibilities. Uh, the first one is that the symmetry is gauged in the bulk. So if the symmetry is gauged, then the story becomes a little bit different. Because now our charged operators that were inserted here, um, they need to be connected by a Wilson line. Now there's a, there's a, a gauge field in the bulk. And the two operators are connected by a Wilson line. Um, and that actually changes the answer. And you can show that now this has to be 0. Okay, And the idea is that when there's a gauge field in the bulk, um, there's really one copy of the U1 global symmetry on each asymptotic Euclidean boundary. And this object here is you know, neutral under the diagonal U1, um, but it's charged under the individual U1 symmetries acting on each boundary. So this thing has to be 0. So if the symmetry is gauged, that's fine. This thing is zero. And then, you know, so the variance is zero, but I also told you that the signal is exactly zero. So everything is fine. There's no paradox. The other uh, possibility, and of course, gauge symmetries are completely fine in quantum gravity. We're very happy with gauge symmetries in quantum gravity. The other possibility is that the symmetry is broken. Um, at least non-perturbatively.
Okay, and you can ask, and this is sort of the final thing that I'll, that I'll describe in my talk today, you can ask, uh, can, we, can we encode this? Um, in the OPE randomness hypothesis, or, you know, really even in the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And that's the final thing that I want to, that I want to present. So let's try to do this. Uh, uh, sorry for- Yes, question, please. Uh, recently few kind of ideas, Malda uh, uh, and the like collaborators are writing regarding DS wormholes. This iter wormholes. So, can you comment on a little bit on that? Uh, not too much. Um, it's true yeah, that um, your it's, yeah. it's true that you run into all types of puzzles as well in the case of the sitter space. And when you think about uh, wormholes, that you know that it, so you can think about preparing states using the quantum gravity path integral in the sitter space context. Mm -hmm. And what wormholes that connect the bra and the ket of your state preparation, whether those exist or not, are they required? Do they make sense? And there's a lot of interesting questions there. I think those are even more subtle than what I'm discussing today. So I, I, I don't have, like, let's say that within the framework of what I'm discussing today, I don't have too much to say about the sitter wormholes. But they're, they're of course, very interesting in their own rights. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That was a that was a great question. So, let me just try to write ETH with charge. And you might have thought that this was uh, very easy, but to the best of our knowledge, uh, we did not find uh, a single paper in the literature discussing this precisely. Uh, so, what happens when you have a, a global charge? Okay, so you now label your states by their value under the charge as well. And now we have a probe, a simple probe operator, OQ. Um, that's it, it, A labels the operator and Q tells us what its charge is. Okay, so what can we say? Um, what can we say about that? Well, first, the diagonal part, remember ETH first had a diagonal part and then an off diagonal part. Now the diagonal part um, actually only exists when, oops, when uh, the probe operator is neutral. Um, because if the probe operator has charge, then it can't be a diagonal part anymore because the things are offset necessarily in charge. Um, so the diagonal part um, oops, exists only when the operator is neutral. And then there's some function, again, smooth function of E bar uh, and QI, I guess. Oops. Sorry, what happened here? There we go. U bar and QI. And now we are, we're, we'll actually see that for the off diagonal part, there's two possibilities. So let me call the first one V1. And the second one is gonna be called V2. Now, the first thing that you can write down is just sort of write the naive thing that you might expect where you put a little delta function here that ensures that the total charge is conserved. Uh, and then you put some smooth functions of E bar, W, Q, I, and Q, J. And you put your erratic function, R, I, J. So that's the first possibility. You say, okay, well, it's, it's very much like you would have expected from ETH, but the diagonal piece only exists for neutral operators. Um, and now the off diagonal piece, it's kind of the structure that you expected, but there's a delta function, a Kronecker delta here. And this assures that the total charge is conserved um, between the three operators. The other possibility um, is to put just, um, sorry. The other possibility is just to put a smooth function G twiddle of A, which depends on all the different, um, variables here. So the average energy, the energy difference, the average charge and the charge difference. Um, and then to put a erratic function. And note that now there's no longer a delta function um, that, is, um, that is enforcing charge conservation, but there's explicit dependence on the difference in charge uh, between the two states Q, I, Q, J. And in, and in practice, this is going to be a rapidly decaying function of the charge difference between the two operators. 
So the second version here does not um, the second version here does not exactly preserve charge conservation, whereas the first one does. Okay. And you might ask, why would you ever do the second version without char exact charge conservation? Well, you know, you might have some microscopic Hamiltonian that you don't have a good control over. You look at the simple operators and you realize that the simple operators have a conservation law, but you don't know if this conservation law is uplifted to a full symmetry of the microscopic theory. And if you want to be more agnostic about whether or not the symmetry is exact in the microscopic theory, maybe you can write down a function like this. And it's important to note that uh, at the level of, of thermal two-point functions, these two things are indistinguishable. In the sense that um, they'll only disagree by exponentially small corrections. So no, so if you if your only purpose you know in life is to compute expectation value of thermal or, or you know, even grand canonical two-point functions, then the two things will basically agree up to exponential accuracy. So you might think they're just as good as, as, as each other, but they do have differences because if you want to compute, you know, OQ, the, the, the expectation value of the thermal one-point function um, squared and then averaged, this is going to be equal to exactly zero with the charge preserving ETH for the reasons that I said but no, uh, above, sorry. But if you compute it with the second version of ETH that allows very small charge violations, when you do it in the variance, you're gonna find something non-zero, okay? And this seems to be the case of gauge where the symmetry is gauged in the bulk. And this seems to be the case where it's, 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 it's broken. So we can also encode both type of effects in our ETH ansatz. And the two different scenarios have very natural um, representations in terms of how things get. Um, so, so let me just conclude. Today, I presented a generalization of each. Uh, which is called the OP randomness hypothesis. Um, and it's it treats, you know, the it considers OPE coefficients of heavy operators in CFTs. Um, and it treats um, any OPE coefficient with a heavy index as a random variable with a given probability distribution, um, which is Gaussian to leading order. Um, then I, I um, proposed an interpretation of the Euclidean gravity path integral. Um, as being sort of equivalent to this OP randomness hypothesis in the sense that um, semi-classical general relativity cannot you know, evaluate actual values of OPE coefficients, but only treats them statistically, okay? And this explains the appearance of wormholes and the lack of factorization. And it's really the idea that you know, the semi-classical path integral can capture you know, at best the moments of a distribution not the actual. Uh, I then discussed the first application. Um, showed that using the open hypothesis, basically resolve a puzzle uh, presented by Miles and Maldacena in terms of the genus two wormhole. Or you can explain the appearance of the genus two wormhole in ADS3 CFT2. Um, and then I presented a second application. Um, which is an argument against global symmetries. In quantum gravity. And there the idea is that Euclidean wormholes are sort of smart enough to, to capture, um, you know, variances of charged operator one point functions and to show that those are non zero. Um, and so that means that basically the one point, uh, the charge conservation needs to be either non perturbatively broken 
or gauged in the book. Um, and this fits very well into ideas of other many other ideas about how um, you know global symmetries uh, get broken or gauged in quantum gravity. Uh, so with that, uh, let me stop here and thank you for your attention. And we can go to the to the question session. Uh, thank you, Alex, for giving such a elaborative and nice talk. It's very clear to all of us, I feel. And thank you. Uh, uh, before asking question, I would ask the participants uh, to unmute yourself and give a clap for Alex for giving such a nice talk. Thank you. And uh, now if you have any specific questions, please ask him. And uh, I think he's very tired already because it is a very long talk, but though he will be very happy to give any answer. And also if you have any specific question, you can write to him. He will be very happy to give you uh, the explanation if you have anything. So please ask. Kiran, do you have any question? Uh, no, sir. Uh, at the moment, not. And Avinash? Um, not really. I was just going through the, these two papers Professor Berlin mentioned. So I, I'll read so, those further uh, and I'll. I would, uh, I'll... suggest uh, one thing, Alex. The particular paper, uh, the, the, the generalization of the OP randomness hypothesis in which you have worked, could you please send me the link? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll send you the link. So I put them here at the very beginning, but I'll also send you an email with the link to the two papers. Yeah, maybe uh, that will be helpful for the students. If yes. they ask, I can send it to them. Yes, absolutely. And I should also emphasize, as you said, um, of course, don't hesitate. If questions come up, you can always email me. I'm happy oh, to... This guy, Pranjal. You know Pranjal. Yeah. He okay. was, when I was doing my postdoc at TIFR, he yeah. was a PhD student at that time. He was a student at Gautam Mandal, actually. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I see. Oh, Pranjal, I know. Very good. Very good. <laughs> He's in probably in Geneva, probably. He's in Geneva, yeah. I think for another year and a half, maybe, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's very nice. Particularly, I am extremely interested in this topic. And I'm uh, not your way i'm trying to uh, handle these things in a different different way but yeah it, it is very good talk i have to say because last okay. talk one guy have given with who's from british columbia uh, james sully you know maybe yeah i know him well yeah yeah he's also doing the similar kind of work yeah yeah i should have probably mentioned that yeah he's doing something also very similar the, the perspective is a little bit different. His perspective is to say that, you know, every time you write down a state in quantum gravity, um, well, the semi-classical observer cannot tell which state it is in the microcanonical ensemble. So we should do a Haar average mm -hmm. over every state that you write down. Mm -hmm. And it, it reproduces features that are very similar to, to what we're seeing here. But I think that the slight difference is that what we're saying here, uh, you don't need to hard average over states. It's a true statement about the individual OPE coefficients of actual energy eigenstates. Yes. But the two propositions, I think, are very closely connected. Yeah. So I feel that like, like both of the talk are very nice. Like he had given when I was in uh, Potsdam. But uh -huh. this one is like uh, very interesting that you have generalized the hypothesis and it, it's really nice actually. I really want to see the work. And if I have any specific question, I will get back. Please don't hesitate yeah, to, to email me anytime. Yeah. So thank you All right. for thank you very much. your contribution. And once this is uploaded in YouTube, I will share the link with you. Sure, please do. And, and good luck for the rest of the series. Yeah, stay safe and healthy. That's very important. And yeah. uh, hope we will uh, overcome with this situation very soon. And sometime in near future, we can able to meet. In person. I hope so as well. Take care, all of you. Take care. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.